Welcome to the first episode of NALA Talks, a microlearning series presented by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or DEI Committee of NALA. My name is Christine Custodio Suero, and I am the chair of the DEI Committee. The DEI Committee works to address diversity, equity, and inclusion to foster meaningful, open, and constructive dialogue throughout NALA and to celebrate the diversity of its members and leaders. Joining me today are NALA President Deborah Overstreet and DEI Committee member Sarah Duggan. Today's conversation will focus on access to justice. Our guest today is Michael Holberg, Director of Special Projects for the University of Denver's Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System, also known as IELTS. We welcome Michael. Would you please share with us about your background and the access to justice crisis? Of course, thanks, Christine. And thank you for having me on this. So with my background, I at IELTS, as you said, the director of special projects. And so I lead a variety of our projects that very specifically focus on access to justice. Um, I, I work a lot in our family justice reform work um, that involves working with self-represented litigants. Um, and then I also work on our legal profession and the Allied Legal Professionals Project specifically, which um, is you know, one of the main things that I'm going to be talking about today. And so to provide some stats related to the access to justice crisis, there are over 70% of civil and family law cases that have at least one party that is self-represented. And then when you get into eviction and debt collection cases, in some jurisdictions, that percentage, is, that percentage jumps all the way up to 90% or more. So there is a huge access to justice crisis. And then, um, you know, diving even further, according to the World Justice Project, in 2021, the United States ranked 126 out of 139 countries for accessibility to court and legal services. And, you know, that problem reaches far up the income scale. Uh, I think the last thing that I have to say about it is that, you know, this, even with each of these statistics, what it doesn't take into account is um, the COVID-19 pandemic and that that has only worsened the situation for a lot of people. And so I, I fear that actually these statistics that I gave are even higher. Michael, could you please tell us more about the work, history, and mission of IELTS? Absolutely. So as uh, as Christine noted a little bit, IELTS is a national independent research center. We're located at the University of Denver, and we work to create innovative and practical solutions to problems within the American legal system. So with IELTS, we have a four-step process to our work. Um, the first is research. We conduct comprehensive analysis, including original empirical and legal research, and, and then we also compile existing research. We then take all of that research and information and we work with stakeholders um, and, and experts in the field to develop innovative models that are designed to address those areas of concern and um, the issues that we found in the research. Uh, going to the third step is implementation. So we empower decision makers, a lot of times judicial leaders, um, across the across the country to implement these models that we that we've worked out um, through collaboration, consulting, and communication. And then lastly, because we don't, you know, we don't want to assume that everything we create just is perfect from the beginning, because that's just not how things work. But the last part of our um, first step process is measurement. So we measure for incomes and outpack, out impact. Sorry. We seek feedback and we uh, refine the recommendations as needed to achieve the maximum benefit that we can. And so 
IELTS works um, in civil issues, in family law issues, the judiciary, uh, legal education, and the legal profession. So we touch um, almost every part of the legal system. Michael, could you please tell us how the efforts of IELTS is working to address the access to justice issue? Absolutely. So what IELTS is doing to address the access to justice issue um, when when you look at so civil and family law, that's two areas that I mentioned that IELTS works in. And a lot of what we do is um, helping create reform that works with or that helps self-represent litigants. So that's working with courts to simplify their processes or um, to simplify their forms, because that's usually one of the biggest issues self-represented litigants have um, in going through their case. And then helping courts increase their use of technology so that self-represented litigants who you know, have limited knowledge of you know, going back to the form issue um, with automated forms and, and creating forms that you can think of like TurboTax, it makes it a lot easier for people who have a limited understanding of that work um, to be able to fill out their paperwork correctly and with all of the information that they need. So that's, that's some of our work. Another piece is um, within the, the legal profession, our Allied Legal Professionals Project. And to go into this just a little bit, so Allied Legal Professionals are often paralegals. Um, they could be other professionals, but, but the majority have been paralegals who are able to provide limited legal services. Um, so they're regulated and they have to complete usually additional education, training, testing. Um, a, a, it's akin to a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant in that they're able to provide more services than what a paralegal can provide, um, but not necessarily as much as a lawyer can provide. And so I also saw a number of states starting to create or be interested in creating one of these, um, we'll call it ALP programs. And, and most followed a similar process of first um, researching what other states were doing and then looking at how a program like that could fit within their state. So what IELTS did is, you know, following our process, we first analyzed existing and proposed programs. We looked at the research that's out there um, and talked with leaders in the states who've developed these programs so that we can really understand and, and get a sense of what these programs look like, but also why they look the way they do. So why, you know, certain educational requirements, why did states choose um, one avenue over another? So we looked at all of that and then we published a landscape report so that states, again, that are interested in creating one of these programs, they could look at this landscape report and see what every other state that has shown an interest in these programs, what have they done? What are they implementing um, in their programs? And um, so the state can then you know, decide for themselves, okay, we're going to follow this model or we're going to um, switch things up a little bit by doing it differently. Um, after that, what we've done is we convened a group of experts who have really been working on um, working on these programs across the country. And we discussed the landscape report and talked about the different framework pieces of these programs. So what practice areas they could, um, these professionals can practice, what their roles and responsibilities look like, whether they would require attorney supervision, um, all of that. And, um, and, and, and talked about, you know, how these programs should look to be most effective and then how we can build out a national approach so that states that are interested can look to the work that we're doing and it'll help um, you know speed through their process because this is it takes a lot of time and resources um, for courts to be able to you know create committees and figure out um, what exactly would be best to do and so we're trying to um, cut a little bit a little bit of that out and so right now what we're doing is we're working on a post convening report um, that, that we're hoping states will look to when they start looking at implementing one of these programs. 
Um, Michael, we have just discussed how IELTS um, is working to address the access to justice crisis. Could you please tell us more about what is happening in this arena across the country? Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. So to, uh, to go into what is happening across the country in this area, I think it's first good to really have an understanding of who is affected with this access to justice crisis, because there's a lot of a lot of data I gave about the 70% or up to 90% of self-represented litigants, but it, I, I think it's first important to understand who these people are. Um, so really it's, it, it, unfortunately, it's millions and millions of Americans and we can look at this in tiers. And so there's one tier is, um, you know, people who are indigent and who qualify for legal aid. So what this means with legal aid, um, it's households with annual incomes at or below 125% of the federal poverty guidelines. So that probably doesn't mean a lot without, you know, I, without knowing what those actual numbers are. And so for one person, that's around 16,988, exactly. So around $17,000 annually for one person. So if you make over seventeen thousand dollars and you, you know, a single, um, a single person, single household, you can't qualify for legal aid. And then for a family of four, that amount is thirty-four thousand six hundred and eighty-eight dollars. So these are really, you know, really low household incomes um, that, a, unfortunately, a lot of people do qualify, but they're still millions and millions who would not qualify for that um and and so uh looking you know at the other group of people who um say don't qualify for legal aid and so who are still in the lower income bracket um who don't qualify but also people in the middle class so just some statistics or some numbers around there but what what this um the annual income of this group or these groups of people for one person so a single um, person household that's making between seventeen thousand and seventy eight thousand dollars so that's obviously a big jump right there but that's showing the very low um of um just above legal aid and then the highest um portion of middle class and then for a family of four, that's between $35,000 and $150,000. Now, a lot of people, even within these income groups and even higher up on the middle class um, scale, still likely cannot afford an attorney. We look at the average retainer amounts, and that's around $3,000 to $5,000 for a retainer. And then you have um, hourly rates between $200 and $500 an hour. That's, you know, that's no small drop in the bucket. And um, I just recently saw an article from Forbes that said the average cost of divorce has gone up. I think it was around 6%. And it's now the average cost of a divorce is around $15,000 to $20,000. Most people don't have that type of money to just, you know, to just spare for um, for an emergency. And so a lot of these people are either trying to go through the process themselves or are staying in situations that really aren't best for them and that they don't want to be in, but they're staying in because they feel forced to. Um, again, looking, you know, more into the middle class, um, the Legal Service Corporation they put out a 2022 um, justice gap report. And in it, they say that only 59% of the middle class were confident in their ability to afford an attorney. So that's, I mean, that's almost half and that's you know, not the worst percentage, um, but other studies have shown that it's actually a bleaker reality and that it's around 40 to 60% of the legal needs of middle income individuals go undressed, unaddressed. Um, so, um, and then the last thing I'll talk about before I then go into what's, what um, states are doing around the country to help fix this is talking about pro bono because this is an area that I often hear as, um, you know, the way to solve this problem. If we just have more people, more attorneys provide pro bono hours, pro bono work, 
um, or you know most states don't require pro bono and so if states would start requiring it then you know that would help resolve this issue but unfortunately it's just not the case if if every lawyer in the country did a hundred more hours of pro bono work on top of the pro bono work they already do this would provide only 30 minutes of legal help for every dispute related problem per household so not only is this 100 extra hours unfathomable um and, and it is because in 2016 the average amount of hours of pro bono work provided uh, were just 37 but and and that was only provided by 52 percent of attorneys and so now you're asking every attorney to provide close to three times that amount and even if they do that's just 30 extra minutes of help and with almost every legal case 30 minutes of help it's nice but it's not really going to do a lot to solve the problem so that just kind of helps show you know where we are with this problem um, to to go into what states are doing they've realized that you know we have to address this in another way attorneys we we can't have just attorneys continue to um, try and solve this and so they've started creating these allied legal professional programs right now there are currently four states that have an active program that being washington utah arizona and minnesota now, minnesota is, is just a pilot program right now but they've had a lot of success with it and so the you know, I, I feel hopeful and I think a lot of people feel hopeful that um, once the pilot has concluded that they will work to create, uh, move it into an official program. There are two other states that have approved the creation of a program and are in their implementation phase. And so that's Oregon and New Hampshire. Um, so that's six states total. And then there are 10 other states that have created a, a proposal to implement or further research the creation of um, an ALP program. And so those are California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Vermont. Now, some of these programs are very active and are, you know, moving forward to hopeful implementation, one of those being Colorado. Um, some have been inactive over the past few years and don't look like they're moving forward, at least for now. And a couple of them have even been stopped for the time being, um, those being California, Illinois, and Florida. Um, but the, the positive is that there are a lot of states that are really starting to look into this, that haven't yet created a proposal, but um, in just talking with, you know, whether it's court leaders or bar leaders or leaders of the paralegal associations in that state, um, that there is a, a big effort to start to look into the creation of one of these programs. With the increasing need for legal services for indigent, low-income and middle-class Americans, are there similar similarities in other fields that are parallel to the legal practitioner programs? Yeah, thank you, Christine. There absolutely are similarities in looking at other um, professions to see, you know, what's going on with the legal profession and even how, um, you know, what we can take from them. So the main example is the medical profession. Just brief history of, you know, kind of what happened over the last, um, looking like 80 years ago. It was during the 1950s and, and early 60s, there was an increase in technology, an increase in um, specialization um, with doctors that it you know expanded the medical field and it also made it so there were less doctors that were primary care physicians and, and more specialists. And so what this started to do was it created a shortage of primary care physicians and especially in rural areas because there were more hospitals being built. Those are usually built in urban areas um, and, and doctors are moving over to hospitals. Um, additionally, the, this was around the same time of the creation of Medicare and Medicaid, which expanded access um, to, um, to people being able to you know, afford 
um, medical care, but that just created a bigger shortage of primary care physicians. And so what this did was it led to the creation of nurse practitioners and physicians assistants in 1965. Um, another, you know, interesting similarity is right now, you know, nurse practitioners are, there are nurse practitioners in all, in all 50 states, but the scope of their practice really depends on the state. And so in some states, they, um, you know, can, can do a full practice, some are reduced and some are restricted. And what this does, it either limits the type of work they can do, or it means that they have to be, you know, more heavily supervised by um, a doctor in order to do, um, you know, some of their work. And this, you know, just from what we've already talked about, just so much parallels the legal profession because we have this gap. We have these people who need the help, who need the service, and and just aren't able to um, to get that service. Now, you. <laughs> You'll hear, you know, you hear a lot of lawyer jokes about how there's too many lawyers in the world. Um, so it's, you know, which could be the case. There's a lot of them, um, but it's a little different from the medical field because it's just, it's just not being able or not charging low enough prices for um, that large percentage that I talked about um, for, for them to be able to afford those services. And, and, and a lot of that comes about also because of the cost of um, the cost of law school and then law school debt, and um, you know all all of that really makes it so attorneys aren't charging these high rates just for fun. They're doing it because they're also trying to make a living wage for themselves. Um, so that's you know that's really where uh, one big comparison comes into play, and so. Um, allied legal professionals can definitely be seen as, you know, nurse practitioners or physicians assistants um, in that realm. And, and I think the same will be true where at the time when nurse practitioners were created and, and physicians assistants, um, people kind of scoffed at the idea and they thought, well, they're not competent enough or they won't be competent enough. They wouldn't have gone to med school. Um, and so they're going to provide, you know, inadequate help. The similar things are being said about allied legal professionals, but the data that's already come back has shown the exact opposite. They're extremely competent. Um, they provide great work. And, um, and and I think just like with the medical field in, you know, any in a number of years, we're going to see allied legal professionals be um, very common. And, you know, we're going to look back at this 50 years from now. And and we're going to forget that, you know, this was even a discussion that, of course, this is a thing because it's um, it provides such a great service. Um, and, you know, with, with this comparison with, with the medical field and, and them realizing, you know, we need to create a solution. I always started this project because we do what we do. A lot of what we do is, you know, try to have our finger on the pulse of what's going on in the United States with um, not just legal issues but also, you know, different innovative approaches that people are taking that we can help um, either spread the word about or help, um, you know, improve upon whatever it may be. And, and that's really what we've done with this project because there, there are, you know, I mentioned legal aid and pro bono, and those are great um, services, even though they're not enough, but they're, you know, I, I should also mention that there are other um, services out there as well. Like a number of states have court navigators. Um, and so they're able to provide general information or written materials, one-on-one -on -one assistance um, in, in some cases, but they're very limited in the type of information that they can provide. We also have like legal document assistance in um, California that can help, um, you know, it's, it's right in the title, helping with their legal um, people's legal documents, but again, you know, they're not able to provide legal advice, so it only goes so far with um, the type of recommendations that they can provide in terms of which forms to use and not to use. And there's a great organization in Arizona, the Innovation for Justice. Um, it's a social justice focused legal innovation lab, and they have a couple programs. Um, one of them is out right now, uh, the 
um, licensed legal advocates where their community, they're not lawyers, but they're community-based advocates um, that can give free legal advice on family law issues. And they're working on um, a, another um, certification for community-based organizations to be able to help low-income tenants with housing issues, something that's really big right now and that, you know, has been big forever, but especially since COVID. Um, and so they're tackling a lot of these issues one by one as well and in, in doing phenomenal work. But the I think the scope that allied legal professionals will provide um, is is just so great that, that that's why IELTS picked this up and, and are trying to help um, other states implement it. Michael, what can paralegals do to learn more about what is going on in their own states? Yeah, thank you for that question. There's a lot of things paralegals can do to, to learn more, you know, about what's going on in their own state. And I, there's a lot to learn as well, because, you know, once you start really looking into these programs, you realize that each state while they have a lot of similarities, there's also a number of differences. And so depending on what state you're in, you know, it, they may have a certain practice area that you, um, you know, that you are interested in. And so you want to pursue this or they don't do the practice area that um, of your expertise. And so you may not want to pursue it. But so it's first important to um, look at look at it and see the differences. And so I'll just go over a couple of those. In terms of practice areas, the most common that these programs are, are putting in place are family law, landlord, tenant, and debt collection. And to, I mean, to me, it makes sense. And the reason um, these are the three main ones are because that they have the highest numbers of self-represented litigants. Um, there are other practice areas that are being included in some of the states. And so some of those are limited jurisdiction or collateral criminal. Uh, in, so what that means, so things like expungements, um, also limited or general jurisdiction civil. And so while that also does cover um, landlord tenant, it also covers things like traffic cases or harassment issues. Um, there's also administrative law, so employments or public benefits, um, those type of issues and then even estate planning as well. So there's a lot of different areas. It just depends on the state. Uh, in terms of roles and responsibilities, most states are pretty in line with this. Um, these uh, allied legal professionals are able to provide legal advice. They're allowed to, are able to um, prepare, sign, and file legal documents. They can review legal documents from um, either the opposing party or from the court and explain what those mean to the client. Uh, they can communicate with the opposing party, whether that be the, the opposing party being um, self-represented self themselves or having an attorney. And then um, most allow, uh, or mo in most states, they're able to also represent clients at mediations and settlement conferences. Um, though the majority of states have not allowed with depositions because um, it's just a little bit different from, from say, mediation. In terms of attorney supervision, the majority of states are not requiring attorney supervision. And so what this means is that, you know, as a, since paralegals are the main professionals that are moving into um, this new profession, it means that you can remain at the law firm that you're at and still work with the attorneys that you work with. Um, and, you know, doing something like that actually benefits the attorneys and the law firm because you would be able to provide more services. You're able to charge a higher rate, um, all of that. But you'd also be able to go out and, and hang your own shingle if you want and do um, start your own practice and um, you know, you can still partner with attorneys if you'd like and, and hand parts of the case off to them or vice versa. Um, but most states are not requiring attorney supervision. And um, so those are just some of the differences and what paralegals can do to learn more for general information, because this is all still pretty new. And, you know, a lot of a lot of states are just trying to gather all the information they can themselves. 
Um, IELTS has gathered a lot of this general information. So showing, um, you know, the information that is provided in the landscape reports so and going through the framework of what each of these states look like. Um, we have, in addition to that landscape report, we also have a resource center. And so it includes a map of the US. And so whatever state, if you're in Illinois, you can click on Illinois and it will give you the, um, the resources and show you, you know, what has gone on in that state, whether a proposal's ever been um, created and if so, where it's at in the process or if they have an active program. And then from there, there's other links that you can dive deeper and see what their program looks like and see, you know, just exactly what um, you can and cannot do as an allied legal professional. Um, for, you know, to really get a better understanding when, um, you know, you look and you see, okay, there is a program that exists in your state um, or, or a proposal. If you're a seasoned paralegal, one thing I would do is find out who's running the program in your state and, and try and talk with them. The reason being is a lot of these education requirements can actually be waived if you have a number of years of experience um, as a paralegal. And so you would be able to, you know, waive that and likely waive the practical training requirements as well. And so you would be able to, you know, jump into being an allied legal professional a lot sooner. Um, you may still have to, you know, take and pass a test or take a few, few CLE courses, but the amount of work you have to do is definitely less. Um, and then, you know, I, I would even say talk with the attorney that you work with. Hopefully they realize the benefits that this would provide them and their firm and you and um, and, and talk about a plan forward in terms of um, even like working out a new arrangement when when you are an allied legal professional and, and how you can benefit that firm. Uh, for new paralegals, I would say, you know, look look into the educational practical training and testing requirements. Um, there's, there's likely a few, you know, additional courses you'll have to take. And then depending on how new you are as a paralegal, you may already have the practical training done. Um, the requirement is completed, but you may not. And so just getting a better understanding of what that looks like in terms of all of the additional work that you'll have to do, um, in order to become an ALP. Um, and then, and then lastly, you know, those thinking about, you know, thinking about going into the profession or those who are current paralegal students. Uh, again, I would look at the educational requirements because, you know, one benefit you have is that you are currently, you know, taking these courses and you can look to see what courses are going to be required and add some of those courses onto your schedule um, or substitute those courses if possible so that you won't have to then take those additional courses later on after you um, have become a paralegal. And then the last thing I'd say is if those are all, um, you know, examples for if this type of program does exist in your state, if it doesn't, I would reach out to your local paralegal association to see what they're doing. Um, you know, if anything, to move the state closer to implementing um, its own program, but a lot of you know, a lot of paralegal groups in um, in each state are starting to talk about this and starting to figure out how they can, um, you know, help move this forward in their own state. And so the more people they have, the better. Michael, what are the educational or professional pathways for paralegals who are interested in getting licensed or registered in their own state? Thank you, Sarah. So the there are a number of educational pathways um, for paralegals, you know, within each state. And so each state has, you know, around three to six different pathways that you can become an allied legal professional. Um, one of the main areas or main ways is with an associate degree in paralegal studies or a paralegal studies certificate. Um, with this, they often require some additional credit hours in the um, the practice area that that state allows, you know, whether it's family or um, certain areas of, of civil law, like landlord, tenant, or debt collection. 
Um, some of them also require additional courses into evidence and legal research and writing. Um, and then, um, and, and so that's kind of what that looks like in terms of the educational requirements. In the landscape report, one of the appendices um, we have actually goes into each state that has a proposal or an active program, and it shows each of the pathways and what those educational requirements look like. And so if you know that your state is um, one of those 16, uh, you, can, um, you can reference that, that appendix. Um, and then I'll just also mention with um, usually what goes along with the educational requirements are practical training requirements. And what we're seeing is an average of about 1,500 hours of practical training um, with an attorney. And there's usually, you know, within that 1,500 hours, there's usually a requirement of like 500 hours um, in family law or like 100 hours in debt collection. Uh, it depends by the state, but um, they usually get more specific in terms of um, where the, what that training is in. Um, and then there's, um, and then also just a, another example is some of them require a year of related experience under um, the supervision of an attorney. Um, so there's, those are some different um, reference points. And um, lastly, I'll say with each of these education requirements, and I kind of went into this, but most states allow, or I think all states actually allow for a waiver um, with, especially within the first few years of the program being in existence. And what that looks like for the majority of the states is around seven years of full-time substantive law related experience within like the past 10 years. Um, and so that's, um, that, that's what that all looks like. But again, the, the appendix in the landscape report really goes into detail of what each of these looks like state by state. Thank you, Michael. On behalf of NALA and the DEI committee, we thank you for sharing the work of IELTS, educating us about the access to justice crisis and providing resources on the legal practitioner programs developing around the country. We will be including links that were discussed in today's episode in the show notes below. We thank you for joining us today on the first episode of NALA Talks. Please join us for our next episode of NALA Talks, a micro learning series presented by the DEI Committee of NALA. Until next time.